Hey there, White Sox fans, Birmingham Barons fans, White Sox minor league system fans. My name is Brett Valentini. I'm lucky enough to host Sox Pop on the farm. This is number, the ah, number doesn't really matter. I think it's 54. Uh, we're going to take a hard look at the Birmingham Barons, the most fun podcast to do. It seems like it might stretch all year that way. Boy, it's really gotten out to a, a fun start with the Birmingham Barons. I'm with GM, President, Ticket Taker. Sweeping up the concession area, rolling out the tarp, whatever is needed with the Barons. Jonathan Nelson does it. Uh, thank you for taking time out of uh, the beginning of a homestand uh, to talk a little bit about uh, your Barons team, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks, Brett. I appreciate it. No, it's it's all of the above, and that's the beauty of my own baseball is that, you know, you check your ego at the door, and, and that, that's part of the diverse sort of job qualifications. I mean, you do. I mean, you, whether it be you know, part of the cleaning crew, park cars, pour beers, whatever it is, mm -hmm. happy to do it and been doing it for a number of years, and uh, just you know, hopefully you will know, continue this homestand and, and have another good one for our Barons fans. And when Thursday rolls around and you're thirsty, you get to qualify to quench that thirst. It's, it's perfect. It works out. It is ideal. And then uh, <laughs> team, I'm, I'm participating. So, yes. <laughs> uh, all right, Jonathan, let's, uh, you know, Barron's wonderful story. We're thrilled with this team because, boy, as White Sox fans or as organization fans, <laughs> we're really starved for a team that is crushing it. And the Barons have been doing that. However... This past week leading into our podcast here was sort of the tough, uh, first tough stretch for the team, uh, losing uh, five of six, five in a row to the Pensacola Blue Wahoos. Thank you, Jonathan, for not renaming, renaming your team the Blue Wahoos. Uh, and that's not that big a slight. Uh, they're first place in the uh, the other division, Southern Division. North, I, I, I don't know the divisions. Uh, anyway, um, so, you know, no slouches, great pitching staff. Uh, you know, a stack team there too. So no shame there. The other good news is <laughs> you lose five in a row, but you're still five and five your last 10. So good things have happened to lead up to the fact that even after a tough series, it's still a first place team. It's still a team that's best in the Southern League. Uh, that's what sort of uh, stack, uh, stacking away those wins uh, early can do. Um, so this is sort of a first bit of adversity for the team. Uh, your outlook on what you saw this this past week or even uh, some earlier weeks leading up to this stretch, uh, just in terms of how your team has performed so far this year. I mean, the, the homestand prior to that, when we played Rocket City, the Angels affiliate, I thought we did really well. I mean, it was a very tough series uh, and not and one that was not easy. And then going down to the beach this past week was anything – but a, a, a nice, you know, getaway um, in so many different ways, at least between the white lines. So, you know, I know that, you know, it was weird because, you know, you win the first game of that series and then drop the, the, the next yeah. five. Um, but obviously the Marlins have a, a quality system. Uh, and, you know, it's one of those sort of blips on the radar. I think you're going to have to have some turbulent times during the course of a season. And the great thing is, is that, you know, despite the fact that Brian Ramos, which we're thrilled that he's, you know, at the big league level and continuing to do what he does, um, you know, our team is intact and, mm -hmm. and, and our team continues to perform well. And, and so now, you know, after somewhat of a, again, a turbulent, you know, road trip, I think it probably helps to come back to the friendly confines of uh, Regents Field. And here's the thing, it's it's no better flex when you if you have to lose five of six, there's no better flex to say, hey, you know what, Blue Wahoos, you might be a really good team, but you're still second best in the Southern League. That's a pretty good one. When you lose five in a row and you're still like, well, you're still looking up at us in the standings. Uh, so it's been such a terrific start. Sergio Santos has been getting uh, more and more attention um, for the job he's done and for what he's doing with what admittedly is some really great uh, talent you know, in the, in the system there in Birmingham, but you still got to do something with it. He's had great success, say, first month, this last week, tough. What do you think, I mean, you know, cliche alert, but, I mean, what do you think he's going to be able to take from sort of that tough stretch and impart to the players to say, hey, you know, just uh, keep your noses to the grindstone coming into this home series? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the losses down there were, for the most part, close games. Yeah. I mean, they were, they, were, they were nothing that got out of hand yeah. or anything like that. So I think that, you know, it's – I'm not going to say it's bullets and board material, but I think it's, it's always an opportunity to where when things sort of slip away from you, you, you recognize those sort of, you know, the, the mistakes that were made. And so hopefully those will be, you know, corrected and, and we'll move on and we'll continue at the pace that we started to begin the season. 
Okay. When you're lucky enough not just to have like the ticket take taker for the Barons, but you know, the president and GM, you can ask these inside baseball questions. So I'm going to probably try and trigger one here, Jonathan. And that is, I'm interested to know sort of what the dynamic is. Obviously, minor leagues is different than the majors because uh, you know a lot of the direction of the team, certainly personnel, does come from uh, another place, and that's you know 35th and Shields and that. But there's still a dynamic where you're working with your you know manager. There's I'm sure a lot of communication back and forth. What is the routine communication you're having with Sergio? I'm sure it's not constant and repetitive and annoying, but clearly, you know, you're checking in with each other. And I'm just wondering how maybe for a typical week, you know, certainly at home, how that plays out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually a really good question because I think with each manager you have, and I've worked with several over the years, is that you sort of have to figure out the, the personality. I mean, yeah. for, for my position, uh, we always, I always want to be helpful. Uh, and I, I certainly don't want to be a porcupine, but I want to be helpful <laughs> and whatever way I can, you know, uh, you know, help, whether it be here or on the road, uh, I want to provide, you know, whatever kind of resources I can, you know, with, with Sergio or any manager. I know that the day after the last homestand, you know, he texted me trying to figure out, you know, the, the cell phone number of the, the visiting manager and, 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 and certainly happy to help him, you know, coordinate the, the on-field, you know, pregame workout schedule and all that kind of stuff. But, but for me, it's about effective communication, respectful communication, and one that's always want to be available to help. Um, there's certain days where, you know, you have to have conversations that, that certainly are not desired when it comes to rain and delays and, and certainly adjusting the pregame routines. Uh, but that goes with the territory. And, you know, I think that first and foremost, we're all on the same page. We all want to make sure that, you know, we start the game and we, we get the game in and get an official game. And my, my logic has always been I want to start the game, get it official and then obviously complete it. Um, and that's not always the case. It wasn't the case the, 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 the last home game that we had yeah. here. Um, but at the same time, you know, you, you want to make sure that you balance everything, uh, whether it be, you know, being fully aware that the conditions are, are completely safe um, for player um, play out on the field and just, you know, make sure that you do your best for the fans that are at the ballpark as well. So there's so many balls that you juggle. But when, when it comes to communication with, with Sergio or manage, the managers or the umpires or, or coaches, certainly just want to make sure that that we do our role in making sure that that we provide all the bits of information that they have and, and that we you know whether it be a delay a potential delay of a game time um that we we have an open flow of communication and, and and that we're as helpful as possible whether it be about any details or questions that they might have even a tea time that they might want to set up for next. <laughs> oh my gosh golf appointments now that is above and beyond uh now you've dealt with a variety of uh, managers, of course, including, I mean, arguably borderline Hall of Fame material in uh, Terry Francona. Uh, Sergio, you know, from, from what I knew years ago, certainly seemed to be the type of personality you are excited to work with. I'm sure that's not always the case, but is that borne out so far in that, you know, certainly new to the organization, hopefully pretty open-minded and, and, and sort of willing and amenable uh, without too much chip on the shoulder, but uh, has it played out sort of the way you'd hoped uh, early on beyond just the wins? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it has. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, he was at Hudson Valley the year before mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, had, you know, I spoke to their GM prior to the season. They glowing, you know, had glowing thoughts about him and, and their experience working with him. And so had, a, had an understanding. And, and so, you know, so now that you settle into the seasonal routine of whether it be rain or whether it be weather issues or just overall normal game day, you know, issues uh, that, that occur, you know, during the season, I think everything is fine. And it seems like that, you know, now that they're going to be back home. And I think that this is probably one of those, those series where they're truly thankful to be home, um, mm -hmm. especially on, on the wear and tear of, you know, not only, you know, the wins and losses in Pensacola, but also the distance at which they were away as well. I mean, I know mm -hmm. that there's, there's certainly a desire and, and there's an appreciation of going to the beach uh, and in that area. Uh, but when you have those kind of results, I think mm -hmm. if you get deeper into the season, there's probably a sense of, wow, it'll be nice to sleep in my own bed and be yeah. in my own ballpark and, and in my own clubhouse as well. So just looking forward to this upcoming series. 
Uh, and speaking of that, um, as we wind up our sort of talk about the team before drilling down into individual players, um, you know, you don't want to look past anybody, but, you know, when the Chattanooga, Chattanooga lookouts come to town, at least so far this season, you might be licking your chops a little bit. So in addition to wins, of course, that's a given, games getting in and being official, and wins, uh, is there something this week or in maybe upcoming um, uh, home stands, anything special uh, you want to chat about that's going on at Regents Field? Well, the great thing about where we are right now is is that now that sort of it's the seasonal change in regards to schools winding sure. down, you know, we had a great, you know, series, uh, home series two weeks ago up mm -hmm. until the, the final day. You know, I don't know if you're aware, but there was a very freak injury on that yes. Saturday night um, that was quite frankly yeah. the most gruesome injury I'd ever uh, seen. Yeah. And, um, it, 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 you know, I was watching Monday Night Football <laughs> Live when Joe Thurston hurt his yep. leg uh, by Lawrence Taylor, mm -hmm. and it was – it was it was very bad, and, mm. and so certainly you know our, our thoughts and, and well wishes yeah. uh, for for him um, and a speedy recovery as best as mm. possible. Yet at the same time, um, moving forward with this home stand, obviously we we start with a unique early game time because we have an 11 a.m. game mm -hmm. on Wednesday. We have a, a 6 p.m. game tomorrow night, Tuesday night. So we start the game, start the series with a 6 p.m. Taco Tuesday, 11 a.m. school day, which will have probably close to 6,000 kids, if not over that. Uh, for an 11 a.m. game. The weather looks great. Thursday, Thursday, we roll right into. And then Friday <laughs> fireworks on Friday. And then uh, we're dipping our toe into the uh, NIL waters and having the University All of right. Alabama back, Jalen Milrow, here Saturday night. So, obviously, you know, he was a fan favorite in these parts mm -hmm. pretty good last year. And, and I know that the expectations and him being one considered one of the Heisman hopefuls going into the next season, I know that, uh, you know, that, that we've got a lot of positive publicity for that. And then we, you know, put a bow on this upcoming series this upcoming Sunday when we uh, do our annual Autism Friendly Day in which mm -hmm. we, we certainly adjust a lot of yeah. our operations to make it more friendly for, for families and, and certainly young people affected by autism. Yeah. Uh, and do the White Sox provide, uh, give, me the details, uh, uh, give me the details on, on how the budget is provided for the 50 to 100 cots that are going to be needed for the Tuesday to Wednesday uh, game? Because I imagine some guys are going to be like, why are we even going home? <laughs> those, are, those are the games where you want a Drew Thorpe patented two hour game. Because yeah. at that point, the, uh, you know, like the old days, Mark Burley, you know, he would yep. turn in the old two hour game. And yep. at that point, the old turnaround to be here at the ballpark between seven o'clock and eight o'clock in the morning makes it much easier yeah. to, to, to <laughs> do this. So, uh, so but anyway, knowing that you, you play early, you get a couple hours. And the good thing is on Wednesday, following the game on Wednesday, um, we've coordinated with the friends of Rickwood. The team's actually going to go visit Rickwood. Oh, team. wow. It's part of their educational experience to, to mm -hmm. sort of see firsthand. Uh, not only Rickwood Field and to see all the upgrades and, and the, the remodeling that's occurred up there in anticipation mm -hmm. for the, the Major League Baseball game and, and their game uh, in June, but also learn about the history as well. Because, mm -hmm. you know, with our game, it's going to be on Tuesday, June 18th. Mm -hmm. I know we're going to talk about that at a later date, but that's, our game is going to be on MLB Network. So for, for all the, the fans that have, whether it be the Barons or White Sox, you want to see the prospects up close and personal, assuming that, you know, we'll have the team intact. Um, you'll be able to watch them on MLB Network that Tuesday night mm -hmm. at 6.15. That is incredibly sweet. Um, and, yes, I think at some point, maybe next podcast, I'm going to just hand the hosting duties over to Jonathan Nelson. He's he's giving us a preview of Brian Ramos. Uh, he's talking Rickwood. Yes, absolutely. In a month's time, we're going to have a nice run-up uh, to the major league, the minor league game, uh, Rickwood history, Negro league history in Birmingham. So that's going to be a fun special edition we're going to be doing for you in about a month's time that Jonathan is going to do along with me. And hey, he might be hosting it because this man is taking control and I love it. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to talk. we got players to talk about because there's a lot of talent as alluded. Uh, and we're going to get to that in the uh, second half. So hang with us for a minute. We'll be back to talk Barons. White Sox fans, my name is Brett Ballantini, lucky enough to host Sox pop on the farm, and this time around, I mean, you know, not playing favorites, but this is my most fun. I'm talking with my very best friend in Birmingham, Alabama. It's Jonathan Nelson, who is the GM and president and a lot of other things he does uh, for the Birmingham Barons. We talk about every month or so, and I'm lucky enough to be joined to talk about some of the really, let's not even, let's not sugarcoat it, uh, or let's sugarcoat it, <laughs> star players, breakout players. Uh, in the system. I mean, we're a month in, okay, small sample size, but you want this sample size and not a lot of the others that we've seen all over the place for too many years in the White Sox system. So it's wonderful to be celebrating wins and incredible 
individual performances, including what, in a way, not surprised based on the fact that Lenin Sosa was injured and the White Sox did need a player, but Brian Ramos, who had got off to a somewhat slow start, had maybe a hot week, 10 days, and sort of has parlayed that right into Chicago. And what I want to know from you, Jonathan, beyond just this, this guy's really rich talent. I mean, he is an exciting, very top prospect with the White Sox. But just from the from what fans have been able to see, uh, having him speak in Chicago, the, uh, and this is something I really didn't even know. He is just, he is so endearing. He just seems like he's the big, I mean, I know they're athletes. They don't want to be talked about as sweet or nice. You know, they got to be tough and superstars. But this guy just seems just supremely genuine. He just seems like a great guy to have with the organization and you're lucky enough to be the last team before the white Sox to benefit from that yeah and, and you're you're 100 on that um you know he's a great kid uh and anytime i go into the clubhouse i usually go into the clubhouse three or four times a day you know at least you know whether it be a drive-by when i say a drive-by just walk through yeah, and right. players will flag me hey listen i got this i got a question whatever sure. it is and a lot of times they don't i mean it's no big deal mm -hmm. and i'm just checking in with the, the, the coaches or the manager or whoever it is um but inevitably you know he would give me knuckles or whatever it is. <laughs> he's just a great kid and you know obviously we always want to see and you know our staff was just thrilled to see him get promoted and we're always thrilled to see all of our players get promoted but but I think that he had a more of a special interest and, and more of a special connection being here last year mm -hmm. and then begin the season as well. Uh, I think everybody on our staff got to know him decently and uh, just thrilled for him. And, and he is as advertised. He's a great kid who has such a high ceiling. And uh, as we all know, as White Sox fans, third base has not been a, a mm -hmm. position filled with too many great players over the years. Yet at the same time, I think there's a lot of optimism and there should be when it comes mm -hmm. to Brian Ramos. Yeah, he's a guy who might not be. A, we just, I, I've been dying. I'm going to get to this in a second later on when we talk about players, but just dying to have a guy hit the majors and just sort of say, you know, I belong. It doesn't have to be Frank Thomas. It doesn't have to light the entire world on fire, but just a guy who just say, listen, I'm here. I'm not. I'm not leaving, and, and let's fingers crossed it's Brian. Uh, not someone that we would have anticipated talking about, perhaps first beyond the matriculated player, but Brooks Baldwin, we did touch on last podcast, Jonathan, and he's done nothing but impress even more. In the field, he's on base like a mad dog. Uh, the numbers I have, hitting 360, 900 OPS, 173 WRC plus. I mean, on a stacked team and an extremely talented offense, he's like head above. Uh, surprised, uh, impressed. Your impressions of Brooks, because you know, I guess we're just going to be talking about him several more times this summer, at least until you pack him up for Charlotte or Chicago. What's going on? Well, I mean, I, I hope that we continue to talk him. Uh, that means that he's going to continue to be here in Birmingham. So, I mean, you know, obviously he's got out of the gate incredible. I mean, continuing to lead the, the team in, in hitting um, and, you know, just, you know, finally started to dip under 400, you know, <laughs> uh, which is uh, quite a statement unto itself. But, you know, whether it be his defensive play at shortstop mm -hmm. or whether it be offensively in the box, I mean, the guy continues to impress. I mean, there's there's a lot of guys over the years that have obviously, when they've come to Birmingham, they've become instant prospects, and they've really mm -hmm. become the, the prospect map in so many different ways. I mean, obviously, we can go over the, the Romy Gonzalez of the world, mm -hmm. Marcus Simeon, or whoever mm -hmm. it is in, 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 in recent years. But certainly, he is one that has is, is kept his, his foot in the door and continues to make a case for himself. So excited to see it. I know the White Sox in recent years have had a log jam of middle infielders. Uh, and some of them have gone on to different teams in, in recent years. Yet at the same time, it's good to see, you know, a continuing to replenish it. That it, that's yeah. a very important, you know, area on the diamond. So really excited for him. Yeah. In the offseason, Jonathan, we knew the White Sox were going to have a rough goal, but I was on the pessimistic side because, you know, hey, look at me. I've been with this team for a while, so I unfortunately skew that way sometimes. Listen, we knew it was going to be rough. And one of the things I think one of our podcasts was said, all right, what's one hope you have for this team? And the hope I had was what I just alluded to uh, in talking about uh, Brianna, and, and that is I want to see a guy – just sort of bum rush the major leagues and sort of act like he's there. It seems like 29 teams have those guys, at least, you know, every decade or so. I mean, sure, Chris Sale, you know, Chris Sale is, you know, Chris Sale's a, a decade plus ago. I, that's what I, if, you know, if it's pipe dream, if it's, if it's Christmas in July, I just want to see a guy come up and say, you know what, I'm here for good. And I, 
intro that because the guy I picked, because I was trying to sort of go off the board and Brianna Ramos did come up, but the guy I said, you know what? <laughs> it could be him, is Wilfred Veras. He's 21 years old. He is he's striking out at a rate that is not terribly sustainable, especially as he sees more challenging pitching in the next two levels. Uh, he doesn't walk. I mean, those are issues that I'm sure he is really trying to drill down and work on. But at 21 years old, he is mashing hell out of the ball. He's basically really right behind uh, Brooks in terms of getting out of the box. And and this is a, a young enough team. You've got incredibly young, talented prospects. And this guy is the youngest of them and the guy who arguably is the most dangerous with the bat. I know we spoke on Wilfred uh, a month or so ago, but uh, I, I need more. I need more, Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, he, he, another another player that you should be excited about. I mean, you know, last year, I know he certainly raised eyes, eyebrows uh, when he was here, and he's going to continue to do it. I mean, he has the, – the ceiling is so tall for him. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is it is unbelievable, and it's, it's, it's exciting to see him play. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where – you sort of – I'm trying to think of the best comparable player in recent years, but sort of a player that all of a sudden you had low expectations, but all of a sudden you're just like, wow, this guy mm -hmm. really has something special in the tank and who knows where he's going to end up. Um, you know, maybe maybe a comparable would be sort of like an Aaron Rowan um, back mm -hmm. in the day when he was with us back in 2000. I mean, a guy that, you know, obviously he was, you know, when he was in, in Birmingham, he played right field, obviously, when he went to the White Sox mm -hmm. and ultimately helped him win the 05 World Series, he played center field. Mm -hmm. But he was a guy that had that special sort of burn within his belly. And you can tell he had some a different kind of gear to him. And it took him a few years, but ultimately, because when he was here, I never thought that he would ultimately – be the center fielder for the, mm -hmm. the champion Chicago White Sox. Mm -hmm. But ultimately he was. And, and and I'm not saying that Beerus has that potential, but he certainly has an exciting certain sort of gears where you don't know where this thing is going to go. And, and so mm -hmm. hopefully he's going to continue to, to, to ride this thing. And, and so we'll see. We'll yeah. See. And he's consistent. Any kind of comparables, but it's because I don't yeah. care a lot of times, but I also think that it's, it's fun to sort of speculate to a degree. And he's consistent with the stick, dangerous, frightening with the stick, and that's while still trying to sort out where he's going to wear his glove. I, I don't have it in front of me, but I know he's been a right fielder. He's a corner infielder. This is a guy who's still trying to sort of figure out where he fits on the diamond as well, which is a tribute to his focus at the plate. But how is that going in terms of, of his defense and, and where he could potentially, uh, you know, end up, you know, playing Triple A or the majors? Yeah, it's, it's a golden question. And yeah. And certainly I'm not involved in that process, but sure. I would have to think he would be a corner outfielder. Yeah. Um, and that, to me, that makes the most sense. I mean, the, the guys who we have playing the outfield right now, I know Duke Ellis spending a lot of time in left field too. Mm -hmm. um, that cat can cover, you know, he's like <laughs> Gary Maddox back in the day with the Philadelphia Phillies. I mean, or Lance Johnson with the White Sox in the mm -hmm. late 90s or 80s is that he, you know, they, he can cover some ground. And, and you talk about a game changer when it gets on the bases. He's the kind of guy that, you know, but, but you know, him playing left field, you know, brings a different level of defense to the mm -hmm. outfield. Um, but Virus, you know, it seems like when Eloy was here, and I know that, you know, Eloy is, you know, certainly – you know, a guy that uh, obviously he was great when he was here. And, mm -hmm. and certainly we, we hope that, you know, things can, his health can get back on track on a consistent basis. Yet at the same time, I know they tried, they tinkered with him on the corner spots in the outfield mm -hmm. as well. But I would think Beerus would be a, would be corner. Mm -hmm. corner outfield. Uh, let's get to Duke. We've got to talk about Duke. Um, here's the thing that's exciting to me is it's not just speed. I mean, speed's the weapon, you know, more so than defense. Speed's his weapon. It's always going to be his weapon. But he's hitting. He's being a, he's productive, and obviously speed is a part of that. But he's he's hitting productively. It's telling me he's healthy, and this is a guy, especially with the rules now, uh, brought even up to the major leagues, where the major leagues are inviting you to steal a base. I'm surprised it's down the way it is compared to last year. I don't know if it's terribly down, but it seems to have taken a step back. Any guy with his kind of speed, and we have literally seen it. He's stealing on pickoff attempts. He just says. Whatever you want to do, I'm taking that base. That is an amazing and probably easier to look. We all want to gasp at the at the at the Wilfred Virus uh, put put one in the pond in Pensacola, and that is impressive. I can't do it, but the speed is an underrated tool that you just do not see very often. There's guys who have some of it, 
not to the way Duke Ellis has. Now we're talking about like Billy Hamilton uh, weaponry and a lot of guys through the years. Uh, that's got to be so exciting to see him healthy enough to pretty much be, you let him on base, it's trouble. Well, one, I, I was here when Duke's dad, my first year in baseball was when Duke's dad was a pitcher for us, Robert Ellis. And so we won a Southern League championship. So this this thing is full circle in so many <laughs> different ways. But, but Duke Ellis, and I'm so thankful that he is healthy. Obviously, last year was, was probably one of his most frustrating seasons. I know he came in with a lot of expectations and a lot of excitement. Yet at the same time, you know, he was, he was hurt pretty much the entire season. Mm -hmm. um, but with him, you know, the speed is something a different, you know, it's not something you can teach. Um, and it's, you know, we, we referenced last homestand is that, you know, last homestand that, that Saturday night where we that unfortunate freak um, injury occurred with Fontenelle with, with Rocket City. Um, we, we went to extra innings. Well, next thing you know, um, you know, he was the last out in the ninth inning. So he gets to second base. And, you know, he's, you know, at second base to lead off the, the, the bottom of the 10th. And I, I, there was no doubt in my mind with his speed and with his complete, you know, certainly knowledge of, 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 mm -hmm. of, of, of running that we were going to win the game. There was mm -hmm. no doubt about it. And mm -hmm. sure enough, you know, with with basically one out, short fly ball to left mm -hmm. field, mm -hmm. tagged up, bang, bang, play at the plate, and he was safe. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, you know, he again, you know, it's, it's one of those things where and, and, you know, from a White Sox fan's perspective, you can't discount the fact of what speed is. I mean, when you have mm -hmm. speed in a lineup, whether it be Scott Pesednik or whoever mm -hmm. it is, it's a game changer. And you have mm -hmm. to have that balance of average speed and power. Mm -hmm. And when you have a couple of those tables, table setters, it, it brings the lineup to a much different you know, level. And, and, and I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. Now, hopefully, you know, this is going to continue for him. He stays healthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, he stays in Birmingham as long as he possibly can. Um, but at the same time, it's very exciting to see. And I know that he he and Terrell Tatum, very yeah. exciting players that, um, that, that to me are, are very reminiscent. I hate to bring up the 86 Mets, but are sort of like Len Dykstra and Wally Backman back mm -hmm. in those days where you had table setters at the top of the lineup that really could do some damage and cre create a lot of havoc on the base path. Yeah. Yeah. Duke Ellis makes the last out of the ninth and the game goes to extras and you know, he's starting at second base. You're the opposing team. You don't exactly roll the ball out to the mound and say, you know what, we're just going to save our energy for this one. But you got to be pretty close to that because just what you said, you know, you're in trouble. That fly ball, the left fielder's thinking it, the catcher's thinking it, uh, the opposing team's thinking it. And that stuff counts. I mean, we talk about the mental game and motivation and, and fear and, you know, <laughs> Duke Ellis, I'm sure, is a very nice guy. He certainly isn't necessarily imposing physically, but he will terrify opponents with that, that sole threat. And, you know, he's got some other tools in his box, too, as well. So uh, not, don't sleep on Duke Ellis. We're going to keep talking about him as long as he's in Birmingham. You know, he's he's a legacy at this point, so we just got to gotta talk about him. Uh, one more guy I want to touch on before we uh, switch over to a couple pitchers, and that is uh, not so much Edgar Carroll's uh, offense. We know he sort of came to the White Sox almost not quite complete, but certainly as a, a very a very well-formed offensive player. I think some of the questions people want to see answered are uh, calling games, defense, how he handles himself as a catcher, because he can probably play another spot. If he couldn't catch, he would find he would play his way into the lineup somewhere because of that bat. But uh, early returns, and certainly all returns in, in Birmingham seem to be that this guy uh, is a catcher of the future, uh, uh, can command a game, can you know call a game, can be that captain on the field. Uh, is that what you're seeing uh, with this guy who really, uh, you know, among a lot of candidates, might be your MVP here for these first four or five weeks? Yeah, it was certainly my first impression last year when he was traded mm -hmm. from uh, California, from the Angels to, to the White Sox. Um, and it certainly is this year. I think that it's, what's, what's great is that they're not putting him behind the dish every night and mm -hmm. the wear and tear of the season really started to add up on him. I think that, you know, the, the, the load – uh, management is, from a catcher's uh, vantage point, uh, I think is is beyond smart and allowing him to really continue development as a hitter. Um, but his his the way he can call a game, uh, handle pitchers, defense overall is is, is I mean there, we've had a lot of great catchers over the years here, and he certainly has the potential to 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 to, to be one of those. That in, in due time, and and I think that he has a world of talent, and I'm just very excited to see where he goes because, in so many different ways, I mean, yeah, I mean, he he was in that uh, 
that that trade last season, and um, he, he was just exciting to see where he's going to end up going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, okay, we're not going to take another commercial break. We are going to seg from uh, batters to pitchers, and our rain delay theater for that is going to be just a quick three questions. I didn't even give these to Jonathan, so he's going to just have to answer on the spot. Need three answers here, uh, Jonathan. Uh, first of all, your go-to ballpark food. My goodness, my go-to ballpark food uh, at Regents Field or somewhere else? It can I, classic. Let's say classic, not necessarily specific. Uh, to but you're well, you're welcome to promote a Regents Field food, of course. Okay, uh, go-to <laughs> ballpark food would be. I went to the Alabama baseball games this past weekend. I got basically a, a lemonade slushy, a, a frosty, Ooh. you know, you know, a lemon chill oh. basically is what it was. So that would be my. All right. Wow. Projecting to even, it's not even hot there yet. All right. That's a good choice. I like, not expected. Uh, okay. Uh, favorite baseball movie? Major League. Oh, wow. You're one of those Major League guys. And wow. Well, yeah, all right. Okay. We'll have a debate about that one day. Maybe an off-season podcast. We'll debate uh, Major League. Okay. Major League's the answer. Favorite player. Favorite player. It could be, I don't know, growing up, just all-time favorite baseball player. It was always tied between Carlton Fisk and Ozzie Guillen. Wow. All right. The commander and I say the two guys who would just go at each other. It's certainly a reflection of the era in which I grew up in. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. They'll talk about a Laurel and Hardy there. Yeah, so it's a good, a great pairing for sure. Okay, uh, Dan, let's talk about just a few pitchers. Um, okay, the pitching staff has been nails. Yes, this this last, I mean, they were all like almost all uh, pitchers duels this last uh, difficult series with Pensacola. Uh, and we actually saw, oh my gosh, uh, Jairo Iriarte and uh, even Drew Thorpe might sort of be somewhat human. Okay, granted. But this, despite an unbelievable one to five rotation and anyway, whatever spot starters as well. The guy who might be the best starter at this point. I mean, Drew Thorpe. Okay. Sorry, Drew. Don't get mad. Mason Adams. And this is a guy that people might want to overlook. And I think this, he's heard it before. Um, this guy is, uh, he's a pitcher. He takes the ball and he gets the job done. Give me your impressions of Mason because, you know, we've noticed him, but especially it would have been easy to lose him in this, in this uh, uh, lineup of pitching you got, this rotation. Uh, and he's standing out to the point where he's as, he's as good as any, and all four of the others are more heralded. No, he's, he's definitely dealing. And obviously, like you said, I mean, Drew Thorpe and Iriarte certainly are the ones that are most notable and from the, the, the trades, the recent trade with the uh, the Padres. Yet at the same time, Mason Adams, I mean, he's obviously dealing this season. And, you know, there's there's something to, you know, it's it, to me it's like Dylan Cease. You know, it, when, when Dylan was, was a White Sox, you know, it, he was, you know, day two, day three, whatever it was, starter. It wasn't the pressure, and I think there might yeah. be something there. Is when you when you start, you know, when you when it's your time to, to, to pitch deeper into the the series, you know, the pressure might not be there as much. So anyway, it's 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 refreshing to see, and obviously, it's something that we're very excited about. I mean, obviously, right now we've got an incredible staff, and and from from starters to, to middle relief to, to to closing, and so it's you know we're going to take it. And I, I hate to continue to sort of just. You know, it's one of those things where you hold your breath with, with our kind of team right now. Um, you know, we're excited. You don't know how long they're going to be here yet at the same time. You know, you, 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 it's like walking a high wire. You don't want to look down and sort of realize, OK, you're, you're living on borrowed time. <laughs> so at the same time right now, just very excited about the staff that we have. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to flex and say, oh, yeah, sure, White Sox, uh, you know, t take take Thor for a spot starter. Oh, you know, or Charlotte, take, you know, you don't want to weaken any links. But when you're as deep as you've proven to be through what is getting to be a, a bigger sample size, I mean, you think you could weather uh, almost anything at this point. Um, a new guy uh, to the bullpen, uh, Eric Adler, really just pitched his way into Merman. Probably the plan for him maybe wasn't necessarily. I mean, arguably he could have gotten the uh, the Barons assignment to begin the season, uh, but also forced uh, a move to double A, maybe faster than would have been penciled in. Um, this guy, you know, I think he's seen maybe a few few games of action. You know what he's done uh, for the Dash and his crew before that. He just seems to be, again, a guy that we wouldn't have necessarily said as some heralded uh, closer, uh, a late guy, but he just he, he takes the ball and he gets the job done. 
No, I mean, yeah, I mean, a six-round pick a couple of years ago out of Wake Forest. So very exciting to see again, you know. And, and I think that's the – obviously that's what you've seen the focus with the White Sox in, in recent – you know, now in the last year or so is that, you know, really replenishing the, the system with arms, um, mm-hmm. which, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, you know, it, it just – you know, it, it hasn't, you know, been there. But at the same time, to see this kind of influx – of, of fresh arms um, and to perform at this level, take these kind of strides, which obviously they, all, they all, from what they always say is that when you know the, the toughest level, the toughest transition is from single A to double A, and to, to make this kind of transition is is very refreshing. So, hopefully, um, you know we're going to continue to ride this thing. As I mentioned, I mean, again, I'm I'm, I'm as superstitious as anybody, <laughs> so that's why I don't like talking about okay. a variety of different things <laughs> in general. You know, sort of baseball cliche. Okay. Uh, at the same time, very excited and and um, just very confident about you know, and and I think that you know, not only Sergio Santos and his sort of keen understanding and experiences as both being both a, a a you know a shortstop as well as a pitcher at the big league level, um, but I think John Eli, you know, you got to give him a lot of credit. Mm-hmm. It's certainly, a guy that he played yeah. here back in the day, back in two thousand and nine, went on to play at the big league level for the Dodgers and I think you know been very impressed with him too his the way he has worked with these pitchers and how relatable I don't think you could you know underestimate the value of of the age of this coaching staff no. uh, with and being being related to these these players uh, being able to, to to communicate effectively and I think that that's one of the the bigger tools of what I've seen with John Eli is that he certainly mm-hmm. has a keen understanding being a player most recently mm-hmm. as well yeah okay I made a note Superstitious. I'm not going to. If, if if there's any question, I'll ask you. I'll ask about ballpark food. I won't make you commit to something that's going to somehow bring the storm clouds. No way. No more of that. Uh, last two guys I want to talk about because I think maybe forevermore, White Sox fans will associate the two. They're lefties. They came in trades uh, at, at the deadline last year. Pretty heralded guys. One sort of took off a little bit more immediately, and now it seems like the others maybe you know caught up and even you know maybe neck moved a uh, neck ahead. And that's uh, Jake Eater and and uh, uh, Kai Bush. Um, both again. We're just always going to talk about starters with your team at this point because you really you can't fall down and not run into one uh, that's just been pitching brilliantly. Those two southpaws have, have really got out of the box nicely and set themselves up for um, you know forward movement at some point and as the White Sox expected in acquiring them. Yeah, very excited about both of those guys, obviously. And and and, and Eater was the one that I know was on a on a, a, a huge prospect just a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so very interesting. And I know that Bush right now, his his numbers look certainly in, in totality much better than, than mm-hmm. Eater. But I think I know Eater's got the talent, and and it's very exciting to see him. And I I think the the great thing is is that you know obviously we we all have a, a keen understanding and, and being patient with the White Sox to see where they are at the big league level and and not wanting to rush anybody and 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 in in recent years i think that that that's probably been the case at times where you know some some players <laughs> promoted but right now there's there's no reason mm-hmm. to do that so i think that that, that to pro- continue to provide a, a quality experience put them in a position to succeed and continue to develop and and gain that confidence and and really continue that rhythm of where they are right now with this team as, as well as with their personal, you know, performance, I, I think is, is, is critical in, mm-hmm. in, in their development. So I, I think that, you know, again, you know, I, I, it's easy for me to say, I know the GM for was it, whether it be Winston Salem or, or for Charlotte probably won't echo the same thing uh, <laughs> because they don't have to live in the life of, of Raleigh right now. Uh, <laughs> The team in first place. Yet at the same time, you know, for us, we're very, we're very appreciative uh, that we're able to accommodate some of these these prospects, play at a high level, and uh, hopefully be a bright spot for White Sox fans as, as they look towards the future. Okay. Yeah. All right. I have one more inside baseball question now. It just popped in my head before I let you uh, a bump and go pull the tarp off or whatnot, Jonathan. That is uh, curious because I know the White Sox rely on you. They'll rely on Sergio and John. Um, and all the eyes uh, on the ground there for this type of feedback. But then they also watch the games. They look at their numbers and, you know, Lord knows seeing the results right now. We don't even really know what how they're driving some of their decision making. But when it comes time for a guy who the, the type of feedback you're giving and how reliant are the White Sox when it's, hey, is this guy ready? Hey, does this guy need more time because the numbers can tell you one thing um hot streaks can tell you one thing and you know again hopefully cooler heads uh, prevail at 35th and shields where it's like all right you know we know we got to see this proved out more in short sample size or hey he's been there too long let's let's get him moving um 
how is that interaction when, I mean, may, maybe using the Brian Ramos example, or, or maybe something where the guy's around a little longer, maybe there's not just an obvious opening for a double header. But what are those discussions like? Because I'm guessing you and Sergio and the coaching staff, you're all going to have at least, you know, you're going to have a seat at the table in that discussion. Well, I, you know, I really don't have it much of a seat at the table mm -hmm. when it comes to that. You know, I'll have a dialogue. I'll ask questions, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm talking to Paul Yenish um, or even Chris Getz when he was in that position back in the day. I'm never hesitant on on providing any kind of feedback mm -hmm. that I observe. Um, at the same time, you know, for I, I want to be respectful of, of mm -hmm. allowing them to, to do their, their job and, and, and not certainly, you know, intervene and, and suggest anything that I shouldn't shouldn't provide um you know i have the full trust I, I think what you're seeing with the white Sox right now is you're seeing a in so many ways you know obviously in, in recent years you know you had a, a variety of different personalities but i think that what you're seeing under chris Getz uh and paul and, and, and barfield as well is that you're seeing you know a, a breath of fresh sort of philosophy and and, and certainly with the new coaches, managers, and, and instructors within the system as well, as long as some that, that certainly continue, that have been with the White Sox for a number of years, you're seeing a different kind of foundational shift in, in culture in so many different ways. And and and, and I think that it's, 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 very, it's a very positive movement. And also with the players too. I think that, you know, with the influx of new players, um, you, you're seeing sort of a, a foundational shift. So I think that you're seeing a lot of things that are, that are positive. I mean, it's like the earth moving. You're not going to see it, you know, mm -hmm. on the interstate. You're not going to mm -hmm. notice it move. But these things are moving to me underground. And in due time, mm -hmm. you'll be able to see the, the fruits of what the, that, that benefit is. Um, mm -hmm. To me, it's it's all very positive. And, and, and again, it's, you know, you, people say, okay, well, you're seeing it in double-A, Barron's, Birmingham's doing great and, you know, having, you know, leading the league in wins and, had these prospects and all that kind of stuff. But I, I think it's, it's the, if you look at the global picture within the, over the, the White Sox system, I think you're seeing that not only with the development of the players, but also see it, you know, in talking with a variety of, you know, scouts within the system as mm -hmm. well. I, I think it's all very positive. And, and I'm a White Sox fan, believe me. I, I, I'm just, you know, you know, I mean, I've, I've come along in, in, a, in a number of different ways, yet at the same time, you know, I'm always I'm always going to be optimistic, yet I'm also going to be realistic as well. And and so I say these things just to, to paint mm -hmm. the picture that 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 not only do we do we have blue skies in Birmingham at times, but I, I think that blue skies are coming from an organizational standpoint in, in Duke. Man. That is the weather report we are dying to hear, Jonathan. See, when you're talking with Jonathan Nelson, you start maybe you're talking, you know, just, you know, rain delay or thirsty Thursday, and eventually you come around to the physics of the earth itself. That's what you'll get in these podcasts. And that's what I appreciate in talking to you, Jonathan. Hey, listen, everybody, we've got sort of a one-two punch in about a month, three week, four week time. Um, early, mid-June, uh, we're going to do, you know, we're going to do a check-in on the Barons because, you know, they'll still be in first place. They'll still be best in the Southern League. They're going to be rolling and romping and whoever's with the team. We're we're going to be talking about them and, and it's going to be some fun chatter but we're also going to have a uh, a podcast carved out to just talk specifically rickwood field uh negro leagues in in birmingham the effort uh, being made with uh, mlb playing uh, a game at rickwood field and on mlb network uh as you just heard at the top of the uh, podcast from jonathan uh the our own birmingham barons playing tribute to the negro league so we want to do a podcast as well as so just sort of devoted to that heritage that history that's going to be exciting and a lot of fun and, and hopefully maybe you'll even be entertained and learn something but uh, jonathan uh thanks i mean let's just i mean ever since we've been doing this your team is great so we may never be able to stop talking i'm sorry to tell you that I'm perfectly fine, and, and we'll continue with this. With the, I hate to say it, but I might even ask you to do it more frequently. As you mentioned, I've disclosed I'm, I'm superstitious. So, superstitious! So, you know, if it carries over to the football right. season, I'll be with football in the Chicago Bears. We'll see. But okay. Right now, so happy to okay. More. All right. I'm not far. If I got to start just driving up a little closer, that's fine. We can do this. I can creep closer and closer to Birmingham. No problem. I can I can make that sacrifice. I've been in for like 50 years. So, what you know, what's what's another strong commitment to the White Sox? I've been doing it all my life, uh, Jonathan. Hey, thanks, everybody, for listening, paying attention, all you uh, Birmingham Barons uh, fanatics. Big, big series. Uh, uh, let's make up some wins. A series going on with the Chattanooga Lookouts uh, here this week in Birmingham. 
weather permitting, uh, let's get some games in. Let's uh, string together uh, six wins and uh, talk in a few weeks again, Jonathan. Appreciate it, Brett. Thank you. Look forward to it. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, we'll be back with you sooner than you expect us.